You are listening to The New Man, Beyond the Macho Jerk and the New Age Wimp. Your host is men's coach and group facilitator, Trip Lanier. What can you learn from a guy who lived the Bible to its word for a year and then pretended to be a hot girl online? What if you never held back? You always said exactly what you were thinking. And why should you, a grown man, consider taking a seat when you take a piss? This week, author and human guinea pig A.J. Jacobs is here to share what he's learned from living life as an experiment. Welcome to The New Man. Today, I've got A.J. Jacobs. He's the editor-at-large at Esquire Magazine and the author of two New York Times bestsellers. A.J., welcome to the show, and thank you for not outsourcing your interview. <laughs> thank you, Trip. Uh, yeah, I thought I'd do this one myself, but if you prefer, I can get someone in India to do it for me. <laughs> well, we're going to dive into your latest book, The Guinea Pig Diaries, but your other books are also unique. In, in The Know-It-All, you read an entire encyclopedia. Is that right? That's right. I read the Encyclopedia Britannica from A to Z uh, in my quest to uh, to learn everything there is to learn. And how many pages, uh, just to give the guy at home an understanding how That's big that 44, is? 44,000 pages. Uh, <laughs> as I say in the book, if you stack up the volumes, this is about four foot eight. So it's a Danny DeVito of knowledge. <laughs> Got it. Got it. And then you, you wrote another book called The Year of Living Biblically, where you, well, you lived, as the Bible said, for a year. You grew a, bo- a beard and wore sandals. Uh, did you stone any adulterers? I actually was able to stone one adulterer, <laughs> uh, but I used pebbles. I used the smaller stones, so that's how I got, uh, I avoided jail time. Got but yeah, it. that was a wild year. I mean, I, I followed just the Ten Commandments alone. I could have spent a whole year doing those. Uh, you know, no lying, no coveting, no gossiping. And I live in New York City and work in the media. So this was uh, <laughs> for 70% of my day that I had to change. Wow. In the, in the guinea pig diaries, you conducted a bunch of experiments in your life. For instance, you masqueraded as, an, as your attractive nanny online. I was just wondering, other than being like <laughs> breaking the law, I mean, what was it like to be a hot chick? Well, this was one of the, this was a fascinating few months. Uh, yeah, we are we have a beautiful babysitter. This woman is single, so uh, I wanted to find her a boyfriend, and she agreed to let me put her on Match. dot com. But she doesn't like to answer the emails herself. So she said, "You do all the work. You read all the emails and answer them, and I'll just go out for coffee with these guys." So basically, I was for several months this incredibly hot woman online and it was an extraordinary experience uh first of all i was getting dozens of emails a day from men telling me how hot i was so uh which is good for my ego you know i knew they weren't really for me but you get that much positive feedback it's hard not to feel good uh yeah but uh, but I also got what was fascinating is I got a, a look at men that other men don't get to see because I got to see how they you know how they try to pick up women so it was a uh, it was a really eye opening. What's a big no no that you learned that a guy should not do on a online dating site? Well, I actually have in the book a list of no nos because I got to be very picky very quickly. Uh, so there's uh, you know. Do not have an opening photo where your your shirt is off. Uh, do not stand in front of your car or motorcycle in the opening photo. Your uh, your username. I got usernames like uh, like sexy gentleman, uh, and I just think that's a little too on the nose. It's uh, you know I think uh, uh, there were. There were guys whose opening lines were, this was the icebreaker, I'm not a professional gynecologist, but I would be happy to take a look. Wow. So that's how he thought that, uh, that this was going <laughs> to, this was going to, this was. That's classy. That's oh, really classy. Very classy. Like so, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I have a list of things in the book. And, you know, it was really interesting because I got to see both sides. I got to see the incredibly sleazy side of men, which uh, I knew existed, but it was hard to imagine just how sleazy it was. Uh, but then I also got to see this wonderful side of men where they were very emotional and open and 
honest, vulnerable. So I got to see both sides. And uh, it actually, in the end, it made me feel better because I, I realized men do have, there are good men out there. That's good to hear. But then, boy, were there sleazy ones. I mean, there were a lot of married men hitting on me. There are a lot of men... Uh, you're probably familiar with the game, the uh, the way to pick up women, uh, sort of uh, the pick up artists. Yeah, pick up artists. So they would do that. They would neg me, which is they would subtly insult me as uh, as a beautiful woman, so that they would lower my self esteem and I would be more vulnerable to them. Uh, so I got lots of that. And uh, but then I got these wonderful men as well. Got it. Well, I joked earlier on in the interview about you outsourcing your life. I think the first thing I ever read of yours was in the in the uh, four hour work week where Timothy Ferris used a big chunk of your article about where you did outsource your life. Um, and I noticed on YouTube how you used your virtual assistants in India to create your promotional video for the book. But what other kind of weird stuff have you used virtual assistants for, like in terms of like helping you have a more easy life? Well, it was. This is a, an amazing thing because I was I hired a, a team of people in Bangalore, India, to do everything for me. So they answered my phone and they answered my email, but they also argued with my wife for me and they <laughs> read bedtime stories to my son. So this is a wonderful life. Wonderful life. I just spent it reading books and and watching movies uh, because they literally did everything for me. They actually read to your son. They on, on like, and they had very lovely lilting voices, <laughs> so I think my son liked it. I love it. So, uh, one of my favorite chapters in the book was where you explored radical honesty, which is oh. where you would not hold anything back. And I'm just curious, like, did it, did you like? Was this like just a battlefield for your relationships? I mean, did was it just a carnage oh, when yeah. it was over with? With you being so, I mean, yeah? you mentioned the outsourcing. That was the greatest, easiest month of my life. This was the hardest, most. Uh, you know, it was just terrible in some ways, uh, because as you, this was started by a psychologist in Virginia who believed that we should never lie. But more than that, whatever's on our brain should come out of our mouth. That's radical honesty. There should be no filter like Kanye West at the MTV Awards. You know, he was <laughs> he was practicing radical honesty and uh, it is a crazy way to live. Uh, the psychologist says it's the true road to happiness. They, you know, you will have some crazy conflicts, but you'll also be be authentic in your life. And I did find that there were some great things about radical honesty, which I'll, I'll tell you about. But there were also, uh, I mean, I, I would go into a restaurant with my wife, and we would run into some old friends of hers from college, and, and they would say, oh, we should all get together and have a date. And I would have to say what was on my mind, which was, no thanks, I'd, I'm happy never to see you again. Uh, and then... They would be furious. My wife would want to strangle me. So it was, uh, it was, and also, uh, as you might know, men once in a while think about, have sexual thoughts. Right. So uh, I found there was a very fine line between radical honesty and creepiness. Okay. And I often, I, I crossed that line, you know, quite a few times. So there were definitely downsides to this experiment. Well, did, I mean, did you find that people were really that fragile? I mean, did you go into this and think like, wow, this is just going to, I'm just going to be throwing grenades everywhere? Or did you find that people could actually meet you where you were and being honest? Well, that's, that's the interesting thing. Sometimes it was a disaster, like a grenade. But sometimes when you're radically honest with other people, they open up and are radically honest with you. And it, it does improve your relationship. I was having lunch with my friend, and I said to him, you know, i got to be honest with you. I'm really I'm angry with you because you didn't invite me to your wedding. And he says, well, uh, you didn't invite me to your wedding. And I was like, I, was, I said, oh, my, uh, that's a mistake. I thought I did. I'm so sorry. What an oversight. And then we hugged. We didn't really hug because we're both repressed. But <laughs> so we really broke through. There were times when it, when it really was uh, a positive. So it's, I try to practice sustainable radical honesty. So I try to keep the grenades to myself. The other thing about r radical honesty is, you know, everyone thinks it's, it's always negative. Like you can say, oh, you know, you, you look, you, your ass looks fat in those jeans, which is part of it. But there's also positive radical honesty. I was during this month, I was thinking about my first boss. 
and I called him up and told him he was an editor at a small newspaper. I told him how much he meant to me and what a great mentor he was. And he was, you know, he might have been a little freaked out because I hadn't talked to him in 10, 15 years, but I think he also appreciated it. And there's that kind of radical honesty we can practice. If the clerk at the store was really nice to me and I just only said thank you, I'll be driving home and I'll be like, gosh, I could have really let that person know how much they impacted my day. Like everything shifted with that person. Like I have a new view of the world that people actually are nice and that kind of thing. And it always is a little painful to hold that back, even the, especially the good stuff. Ah, I love that. Yeah, I agree with you completely. So uh, one of the other experiments you did was where you explore being, I mean, for lack of a better term, your wife's bitch for a month. So, I mean, do you, do you think that? <laughs> yes, that one I was, that's the, the name of the chapter is uh, Whipped. And it was actually suggested by readers. They came up with this idea because I, I, I've done these experiments for years now. Uh, and my, you know, my, my wife has put up with a lot, you know, it can be a pain in the yeah. ass for her uh, during the Bible year. The Bible says you cannot touch women during their time of month. And even more than that, you cannot sit on a seat where a woman who was menstruating has sat because then the seat is impure. (laughs) So my wife found this offensive, and she sat in every seat in our apartment, uh, and I was forced to stand for the year. So, you know, living by the rules of the Old Testament was was just one of the many things she's put up with. But... uh, so they said, you owe her. You've got to spend a month doing everything. you got to spend a month being her bitch. you got to spend a month uh, massaging her feet and watching Kate Hudson movies and doing whatever she asks. So that is what I did. And do, do you think that most women really want this whipped guy, the yes man, the nice guy, to actually be their partner? Or is it just a good idea? Well, I can't, t- I can't tell. I can't speak for all women. I mean, part of my strategy was I would be such a yes man, such a doormat, that my wife would, would say, oh, I want that pain in the ass guy back. I want that guy who disagrees with me. And, <laughs> uh, and you know what? That never happens. I kept waiting for it to happen. And she says, no, I'm loving it. This is great. I want you to be like this forever. Was, oh, man. <laughs> So, uh, is it still that way? How much of how much have you come back to being a pain in the ass? Well, I definitely backslid. Uh, you know, you can't live like that. You know, it's an interesting experiment. It's a little dangerous for men. I will say one thing that I recommend is, is if you're going to do this, get do the opposite as well. Do a, do a week where you do everything your wife says, and then have her do a week where she does everything you say. All right. And I think that will actually improve your relationship because you'll each get to see the world from the other point of view. Unfortunately, my wife put the kibosh on the second part. She's like, no, nah, I'm not going to spend the week doing everything <laughs> you say. But, uh, but I think in general that, that would make it. Uh, a more equitable experiment. Yeah, on, on, on a side note, you make a case in your book for uh, why it's why it's a good thing to pee sitting down. I'm just curious if that's why is that a good idea? I mean, it's one of the <laughs> pleasures of being a guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that one uh, was. Uh, I came. There's actually a Larry David's Curb Your Enthusiasm episode where he he talks about how he pees sitting down, and uh, there are a couple things. I don't I don't do it all the time, but sometimes I do it. Uh, there are a couple of reasons. One, you know, you do get uh, you get like a minute where you can read you can read a very short article. You know, it's uh, it's nice uh, instead of just staring at the wall. And secondly, I read this one book, sort of a cultural history of the bathroom, and the stuff in there was so alarming about how when you pee standing up, the splash factor, that uh, that little particles of, of uh, your pee go all over the place onto your toothbrush. And I was so uh, <laughs> repulsed that I vowed never to do it again. All right. <laughs> okay. what, if, what, if, what have you considered doing but then chickened out on? I mean, what, what are we never going to get to read? But you, you maybe you thought about trying it out. You got anything to share there? Oh, sure. Uh, lots of them. I mean, I also get lots of suggestions. A lot of people say they, they think that I should do every, uh, every position in the Kama Sutra. Uh-huh. But uh, that one, again, my wife, first of all, rejected it. And I even 
I'm not sure I'd want I'd be up for it because it's like some of those are really yeah you know they require a lot of flexibility. You could get injured easily. Yeah, exactly. It's very dangerous. <laughs> so without supervision, <laughs> and I'm not sure I'd want someone supervising. <laughs> that one was put the, the they put the kibosh on that. Uh, I really wanted to do one where I I'm very interested in Facebook and technology and. Instant that how this is transforming human relationships because I think it's like a revolutionary shift. And I, I wanted to, I said, well, what would it be like to only communicate by Facebook, no face to face contact, just Facebook, I am, uh, all that stuff. And my wife, she said, uh, you know, listen, we've got our nieces about Mitzvah coming up, and you are not going to Skype your way to the table. You know, you, <laughs> you're not going to be there in a monitor at the table. You're going to show up and, and eat the damn chicken. So I think a lot of people work worry about what others think so much that it usually keeps us from taking risks. And I just wonder, like, did you find it liberating to be walking around in a beard and sandals or, or kind of portraying George Washington on the street? I mean, do people really care? Is it, is it that big of a deal? It is liberating. It is liberating because it's almost like playing a character and then you become the character. I mean, that's one of the big lessons of, of my experiments is that you act in a certain way and you start to think in that way. So, uh, you know, the sort of the behavior changes your thoughts. It's uh, they talk a lot about this in cognitive behavioral psychology. How, uh, you know, like in the Bible, I, uh, you know, I would start to act in a biblical way, and uh, and then not gossip or not uh, not lie, and then I I sort of lose the urge to gossip and lie. So it was really it was really interesting. It seems like it's it could be similar to how like that movie The Secret portrayed where your thoughts create your reality but this is different how, how is it different though? It's all about the behavior creating your reality as opposed to the thoughts it's that you change your behavior thir- first and then your your thoughts catch up like with uh, I did this one where I followed all of George Washington's rules of life when he was a young man he wrote 110 rules of life on on how to be a better person and uh, they're really fascinating they're wonderful they're all about self restraint and discipline self discipline and uh, and respect for others and also by the way not adjusting your private parts in public that is literally the second <laughs> rule of the 110 rules is do not adjust yourself in public. So obviously a big concern of his. But anyway, when I was acting sort of more more like a civilized, I started by acting like a more civilized person. And then I I, uh, sort of felt internally that I became a little more of a civilized person. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. I mean, you've immersed yourself in some pretty old school practices and ways of being. I mean, stuff from the Bible. You even did some Zen meditation in this book. And I'm just wondering, what are some things that we should consider bringing back? I mean, other than like, you know, the obvious one of like not adjusting yourself in in public, but (laughs) what should we, what should we bring back? Yeah, I think a lot of uh, hip hop stars and baseball players could use that. (laughs) that Well, there's lots. I mean, it's a great question because there's so much I've learned that I think that would apply to us now. Uh, one was from the Bible, the Sabbath. Uh, I am. I think that this should be observed, whatever you believe. If you're an atheist, an agnostic, someone spiritual, it's just a wonderful way to live. It'll make your life so much better because we work way too much. We work 24-7, and the problem is that there's no distinction between the weekend and the weekday and the even the, 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 the day in the night, you know, the BlackBerry is a 24-7 master, and I think we lose something. We we stop appreciating life so much, uh, and just the, taking this one day off, uh, one rabbi calls uh, the Sabbath a sanctuary in time, sort of a sacred space in time, where you spend it with your family, you step back and you say, oh, you know, wow, this is really amazing, the the fact that, you know, I have this life and count your blessings, all that kind of stuff that that you just lose if you're constantly on the treadmill. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about what you learned from eliminating multitasking 
uh, in your life. You, 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 you called yourself a unitasker. Right. I'm trying to start a movement of unitasking, just doing one thing at a time, uh, because we are addicted to multitasking in our society. And it's the more research I did, the more I realized how hugely detrimental this is. I mean, it's not a small thing. It, it makes us less happy. It makes us dumber. One study puts the number at 10 IQ points. When you're multitasking, you're, you're 10 IQ points dumber. Uh, and so I try to do one thing at a time. And right now I am unitasking. I'm just talking to you. I'm not answering my email. Uh, I'm not mopping the floor. It's a wonderful thing because you you forget how much better you do things when you do them one at a time. And you're actually more productive when I'm just talking on the phone and, and not answering my email. I'm actually listening. I mean, it's a shocking concept. I'm actually engaging in the conversation as opposed to just going, uh-huh, right, uh-huh. Uh, so you get things done. And I actually, I think there are ways to to stop yourself from multitasking. I mean, I went to the extreme. I, I sort of blindfolded myself while I was on the phone. <laughs> Just cutting your internet access off for a couple hours a day, that's important. Uh, or or putting your uh, putting your iPhone, you know, in a closet and, and locking the door for, for a part of the day. All these things will make yeah. your life better. I, I, and I got that you actually enjoyed what you were doing more, that you seemed to notice that things were more fulfilling and satisfying if you were actually there to pay attention to it. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if, if you're paying attention to eight things at once, you're not really enjoying anything. And, and the other thing is, I mean, uh, biologically, multitasking increases the, the stress neurochemicals in your brain because it's more stressful. So this idea of always being switching between one and another and, and trying to pay attention, it's stressful. Got it. So what's one thing a guy can do today that will help him create a better life for himself? Something simple, just one thing that he can do. What would you recommend out of all the stuff that you've done? What's one thing? Well, uh, it's hard to choose because um, there's so many that have changed my life for the better in the, in the new book and also in the old ones. Uh, one thing that just comes to mind is, is the idea of gratitude, because uh, uh, this I, I did a lot of during the year of living biblically, uh, because the Bible says that you should always be thankful. So I was really being extremely thankful to a fault. Uh, hundreds of times a day, I would be thankful for the littlest <laughs> things. You know, I'd be thankful. I'd press the elevator button and be thankful the elevator came. Or get in the elevator and be thankful it didn't plummet to the basement. And it was a, a strange way to live, but it was also great because you do realize there are hundreds of things that go right every day that you just take grant for granted and, and don't even notice. And you just focus yeah. on the three or four that go wrong. So I would say this idea of, of being aware of all the little things that go right. You know, when the newspaper in the morning comes on time, you know, be thankful for that and realize instead of, you know, uh, being furious on the one day a year, it doesn't come on time. All right. Clear all of those distractions and focus on these big takeaways. Number one, if you're using an online dating site, lose the picture of yourself without a shirt leaning against the Camaro and reconsider that opening line where you express your talents as an amateur gynecologist or find yourself another podcast, your choice. Number two, remember, you can outsource more than your billing and travel planning to a virtual assistant. Consider delegating your family squabbles and parenting duties, too. Number three, if you're considering the practice of radical honesty, start with the positive stuff. What appreciation have you held back? Write a card or make a quick call to tell someone how they positively impacted you. You never know when you'll get another opportunity, and I doubt you'd ever regret it. Number four, apparently pissing into an open bowl is a hygiene nightmare that results in your urine fondling the toothbrush six feet away. So keep that in mind. However, I'm still going to piss standing up. Number five, 
AJ has conducted tons of these personal and social experiments that last for weeks and sometimes a year or more. If you're living your life in a confined way, consider that those around you will get over it should you decide to blossom out of that box and just be yourself. Take the lid off. If AJ can survive a year as a biblical hero, you can probably let down your hair a bit too. Number six, behavior can change the way you think. If you're trying to shift some stubborn way of being, try shifting the behavior first. AJ and many cognitive psychologists believe that where the body goes, the mind will follow. For example, AJ quit gossiping and lying, and soon after, his desire to gossip and lie subsided too. Number seven, don't adjust your dick in public. Number eight, observe the Sabbath, and if that term bothers you, then take some time off every week. AJ insists that taking a full day off from work and the iPhone will help you enjoy the life you've already got much, much more. Number nine, quit multitasking. It makes you dumber, increases stress, and decreases your sense of well-being. Shut off the internet for a while and focus on one thing at a time. Hell, you may find that you actually enjoy your work. And number 10, get into the habit of being thankful. Focus on all of the things that go right in your day instead of the handful of things that don't. The end result is that you'll really get how amazing life already is and you won't be such a buzzkill to those around you. Quit your bitching and say thank you. Where can we find out more about you? Where can we purchase your books? Help us, help us get to know AJ Jacobs a little bit better. Uh, my website is ajjacobs.com, and my books are uh, The Know-It-All, The Guinea-Ting Diaries, and The Year of Living Biblically, and they're all on uh, at your major bookstores and online, too. Wonderful. AJ, thank you so much for being on the show. I'd love to have you back on with the, when you've had a chance to uh, do some more of these crazy experiments. <laughs> Well, I loved being on, and, uh, and thank you so much for having me. It's a fascinating show. If you're thinking about taking what you're hearing on The New Man and making it a reality in your life, check out the free video available at thenewmanlife.com. That's thenewmanlife.com. Thanks for listening.